formally welcome everyone here to this month's Making Mitigation Work webinar series. My name is Lori Peake, and I have the honor of serving as the director of the Natural Hazard Center here at the University of Colorado Boulder. And at the outset, we just really wanted to thank all of you for joining us for this month's Making Mitigation Work webinar series. And as has become our tradition, if you would, please, let's take a moment and if everybody could just put in the chat, where are you joining from today? And so I'll kick us off. This is Lori, and I am joining from chilly but sunny Boulder, Colorado. And please know wherever you are joining from, you are certainly welcome here today. And one thing I just wanted to say at the beginning of this month's webinar is that while most of our webinars feature U.S.-based speakers and many of our participants are based here in the U.S., these webinars have attracted people from all over the world. And with the humanitarian crisis from the recent earthquakes in Turkey and Syria that are still unfolding, we just wanted to send all of our love and care to our colleagues there and throughout the world who are working so hard to try to mitigate the suffering from disasters like the ones that we are seeing unfold right now across the ocean. And so thank you again to everyone who is here today. Thank you for the work you do. And with each disaster, we are reminded of exactly how urgent and pressing this work is. I also just want to at the outset acknowledge our partners at the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the National Science Foundation who support this webinar series and really had the vision to recognize that we needed a space to come together to talk about reducing the harm and suffering from disasters through mitigation practice, policy, and research. And so thank you for that support. And again, thank you to all of you for being here today. Before we go any further, I just wanted to make sure and remind everyone that today's forum is being recorded and that we do post all of these forum recordings on our Natural Hazard Center website. And you can go there and find dozens and dozens of past webinar recordings that we hope can be useful to you in your research and practice. I also wanted to remind everybody that thanks to an ongoing partnership with the International Association of Emergency Managers, we're able to offer one contact hour of emergency management training certification through IAEM. And so if you are interested in getting that contact hour of credit, the only requirement is that you attend this webinar live for its duration. And on the screen via the slides, you can see that you can reach out to Katie Murphy at Has Center, which is H A Z C T R at Colorado.edu, an email address that she will also put into the chat uh, with information on getting your credit for attending today. So many thanks to IAEM for making this possible. Also, to our always very active and engaged webinar participants, just a reminder that you are welcome to use either the Q&A or the chat box in Zoom. And then, um, Katie, just a quick moment. Are, are you still seeing my screen? There we go. The, the Thank you. I think for a moment I was maybe seeing a different one. Katie, can you go ahead and um, there we go. Thank you. Uh, Today, we're going to be hearing for this uh, webinar series about the Resilient Nation Partnership Network. And this network is a really exciting network that is meant to bring together diverse voices, organizations, and institutions that are helping communities to become more resilient to uh, various natural hazards, disasters, and climate-related events. And so, Without further ado, I am especially excited to welcome our longtime friend and partner, Bradley Dean, or Brad, as we fondly know him, who is the communications and partnership uh, specialist with the Federal Emergency Management Agency's Risk Management Directorate. And Brad is going to share with us both sort of some of the long standing activities through the RNPN, as we fondly know it, but also some of their new programs and initiatives. And Brad has promised us that he's going to leave plenty of time for questions and answers and really for participant engagement at the end of this webinar, because as always, not only is he looking forward to share in the special way that he always does, but also he's particularly excited to hear from all of you about your questions, ideas, 
and other possibilities for advancing this vision for a more resilient nation. And so please join me in a warm virtual welcome uh, for Brad Dean. And Brad, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and over to you so you can share yours. Thank you. Awesome. So just confirming, Lori, that you all can see my screen? Yeah, yes, it Great. looks wonderful and it's in full screen mode. Awesome. Um, so so first, Lori, you always give the best introductions. So thanks so much. Um, I appreciate it. They're always the nicest introductions too. I, I seem so, uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so my name is Bradley Dean. I work um, in FEMA's Risk Man Management Directorate, as Lori mentioned. Um, for those of you that aren't or don't understand the internal logistics of FEMA or the where we sit, that is on the pre-disaster side under resilience. And so um, a lot of the things that we do in the risk management directorate, if you could imagine all of the myriad of risk reduction activities that FEMA would be partake in prior to disaster, most of them, or pretty much all of them, sit in the risk management directorate. So Lori mentioned, obviously, the earthquakes that um, we've seen in Turkey and Syria. Um, FEMA does participate. We have the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program. We also have, that sits in the Risk Management Directorate, we have the National Wind Impact Reduction Program. We do building sciences here. We have our um, dam and levee safety. We do all the flood mapping. We have the hazard mitigation planning program. Uh, we do risk communications like we're doing right now. So all of that sits, and I, I know that I miss some, that all of that sits in one place. And so as part of, uh, in support of that, uh, now seven years ago, it's crazy to think about that, right, Lori? I think you were one of the few people that have seen it over the, like the last six, like almost that entire time. Uh, the Resilient Nation Partnership Network, which was stood up, and so it was originally forty people in a room. And, and sometimes I wish it was still forty people in a room. It's like really intimate. Now we have over sixteen hundred organizations represented, and um, that's been a really, really giant changing growth. But the the purpose of it and the origin was really to because we had such a diverse profile and we knew that we needed to really engage with a diverse group of stakeholders, how could we be more inclusive? How could we bring risk information to a much broader audience? Uh, in many cases, to those who have never really interacted with FEMA before, and in, in the best way possible, we really, we really search out those organizations and those people um, because that's where we see the most, um, a lot of the value and the greatest gains, right? To bring risk information to people that have never um, seen it as part of their mission or as a priority before. And so, so what is the RNPN? Um, I mentioned we have representation now from over 1,600 organizations. That's really, and we take a lot of pride in this, the whole community. So academia, private sector, nonprofits, government agencies, local um, elected officials, tribes, territories, um, international folks as well join us and um, that's really something that we, we continue to push the expansion of who, what, who our reach is and who is involved to gain a lot of those different perspectives. We have three priorities that drive our work. So promoting natural hazard mitigation and climate adaptation actions, advancing equitable resilience initiatives, and um, most importantly, expanding capacity through partnerships. So we really want to be a catalyst for groups and individuals to get together and work together. I, I, we often say that this is the most selfish thing we do here at FEMA uh, is to help everyone else out because the better you all do at risk reduction, the easier our job is. That hasn't really caught on a lot, but I think um, it is really important. The, the things that you all do really matter and any way that we can create additional interactions with like-minded organizations or organizations with capacity uh, where you have a need, uh, we want to do that. So we have a couple of different ways how people can participate. Um, the first is our newsletter. So we host um, once a month, the newsletter goes out. Um, it is very active. We constantly have, um, have to redesign it numerous times because we just get a lot of events, uh, recent research that's come out, um, opportunities to share perspective. And so once a month that goes out, we try to be as predictable as possible. The solicitation for the newsletter, if you have something exciting to share, um, we do holistic resilience. So there's not any very specific category. We like sharing um, all the different perspectives. The solicitation for that goes out at the beginning of the month in the first week, and we publish it on the third Wednesday of every month. Um, 
We also have resilience exchanges and ideation hours. So these are our monthly events and they're framed a little bit different and we'll dive into those specifically. And then we also have our annual partnership forum which happens every month in October. And so the, like I mentioned, the newsletter is really designed to be an opportunity for partners to, to highlight all of their initiatives, updates, events that are centered on resilience. Um, here's our email. You can send us your submission now. We're actually collecting submissions for the February newsletter currently. Uh, again, that will go out on February, I believe it's the 18th, no, 22 minus seven. So uh, the 15th, I'm sorry. Uh, Okay, so we have resilience exchanges. These are our monthly, um, like moderated, very kind of um, thought leadership type sessions where we have a moderator and a panel. We bring experts in an area uh, specific to natural hazard resilience or climate adaptation to share their knowledge and help kind of advance some of these conversations. So we have had um, an event on seismic risk uh, last year where we brought in the LA Times uh, the chief resilience officer at the time for city of Charleston, South Carolina, because this isn't just an, kind of an East Coast problem. Uh, we had an NGO from Washington and we had USGS as well. And so we usually have about two to 300 people per month uh, for these events. And it's really great. Um, that number continues to expand, which is um, a great challenge sometimes. Ideation hours. These are probably our most popular event right now. And I think we're really thinking about how could we do or integrate more of this style into our work. Um, this originated in June of 2021. We held the first one. We're very transparent with the RNPN. We, we told all of our attendees, this was a new thing. We're trying something new. Uh, it's very audience participation based. Uh, it is not a panel, everyone participates. Uh, like it mentions, it's kind of quarterly right now, but it's a freestyle event that everyone can share their ideas to and foster connections and identify collaborative opportunities. And so the way it's framed is every we break out into um, breakout rooms for a majority of the time. We have an expert in a given topic facilitate the dialogue in, in that room. We have a virtual whiteboard where people can provide um, all of their feedback and things. And there's actually a lot of behavioral science that goes into this. And I'm saying this specifically for Lori. So I hope she's smiling because I can't see her face. But there's actually multiple means of participation that's available in these types of events, depending upon how people want to do that. Um, usually we have about 50 to 75 people in a room, in a breakout room. And so there's people that really want to act, actively participate, right? They want to come off mute. They want to engage and have a conversation with the facilitator. It's great. Um, we've all been in rooms where you either have too many of those individuals or you don't have enough. And so we try to kind of manage how many people come to the ideation hour so that we're not overwhelming it uh, with too many people. We also have those individuals that aren't necessarily comfortable with sharing those perspectives. And that's what the digital, one of the primary reasons we have a digital whiteboard so that people can go in there and provide their feedback without necessarily having to come off mute and, and sometimes having that discomfort of speaking in front of a larger audience. And then we also allow obviously for passive participation, but these are really great. We take notes during the whole thing. People share resources, they share their contact information, um, they share opportunities for collaboration. And we share that out with the entire, the entire registration list after the event. So people can revisit that and then search out some of those potential partners. After um, our events, we do these insights and reflections, we call them, and it's pretty um, straightforward, but it captures the themes and the top takeaways from each of the discussions with input from the panelists. So um, in the example here, you can see that we had an arts and adaptation event on the right, and then on the left is the kind of like what the summary of our ideation hours look like, and we have all the different resources and contact. You can find these on the RNPN website, which, um, I think someone on my team or we'll drop the link in a little bit later when I have not this, this I can share my screen uh, to the website, but there's resources on there. There's recordings, all the things that you're looking for that we do, they can be found there. Um, kind of the premise of this. So that's the background. That's what the network is about. A lot of the premise of this conversation and um, the discussion I had with Lori and Katie about was, you know, over the last three years, we've been working on um, and advancing our alliances, uh, our, our alliances 
initiative, our building alliances initiative. And so that really started, um, this is the 2020 forum, but I think it was, it was kind of crazy because we had been preparing for that October 2020 forum for over, about a year and a half. Um, we had been in discussions with NOAA to host that in person at the NOAA Science Center in Silver Spring. And then this weird thing, COVID came around and then we, we had to delay. And so, um, but one of the things that happened during that is all of these groups of people, all of these amazing equity experts, it gave us additional time to really build longstanding and trusting relationships with them. Uh, at the time, and even still, FEMA didn't necessarily have a, a, a high level of credibility in the space, uh, in the equity space. It's something that we're seeing dramatic improvements in, I think, but at, at this time, it, was, it wasn't there. And so the right place for FEMA to be a part of this conversation was really to be the convener and to bring these people together and, and work with NOAA to help advance these conversations. And that's, so that was our first, that was kind of the first of the um, building alliances and that was our alliances for equity forum. Out of that, you don't just bring the people together. Out of that, we had a lot of, we, we tried to figure out, well, how could we leverage? It's not just this event. What could we do? We want to do more. And that's where really the kind of building alliances piece came together. So we brought all of those individuals that participated in the forum together um, to co-create this Building Alliances for Equitable Resilience resource. And part of that was storytelling. We wanted to make sure that we were working with some of these people to help tell those personal stories so that we could better connect with them and understand what motivates them. Why do they do this work? Why is it important to them? And so that was our first kind of foray into this advancing storytelling. And so in the upper left, you'll see Nikki Cooley, um, she has been a fantastic um, partner and has now become a friend. She works for the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals. And um, if you if you don't listen to that recording of Nikki and want to go out and do everything you can for, for climate, I, I, there's nothing else that's going to motivate you because she's amazing. Um, you know, and, and Jake White down on the left, he formerly was with the National Association for Latino Community Asset Builders. I really love his story because when we first engaged him, um, his first reaction was like, hey, I don't do hazard mitigation. I don't, I don't do climate adaptation. And that was okay. You know, one of the things that we had to explain to Jake was, look, if NOAA and FEMA coming together don't have natural hazard mitigation and climate adaptation covered, we have bigger problems. What we really wanted to learn from Jake was how to engage the Latinx communities. And through that partnership building and that development and preparation for the forum and, and subsequently after this resource, he started having conversations with a lot more of his colleagues across the country, what they were doing in this space. And he started realizing that a lot of the problems that they were experiencing from hazards or climate were really impacting and becoming a greater part of their mission. And the specific example he used was in Miami, where um, a lot of lower um, like underserved Latinx communities live on the highest, I mean, it's weird to say the highest ground in Miami, but the highest, on the highest elevated ground in Miami. Well, that's also becoming some of the highest property value. And there's this climate gentrification that's occurring there. And it was this connection across his um, organization where he realized like that work was central to what they were doing. And it was like this epiphany moment for him. And it was a really great uh, example of like, this mutual value that we were able to bring is like we were being able to integrate hazard mitigation and climate adaptation. And he was able to bring how they're in, um, you know, making it more accessible to engage Latinx communities and make them more economically um, viable and economically competitive. And it was really fantastic. So we follow that up with um, the 2021 forum alliances for climate action and um, there were a lot of big changes and we really wanted to go super hard on climate. And again, this was one of the places where FEMA as an agency did not have a, a lot of credibility. And it was the same situation. It's like, what is the best role for us at this time? And so we, we worked again with some, one of the most, first of all, the, I don't unarguably the coolest federal agency, the only federal agency where I see people going out and getting multiple t-shirts from, right? NASA is absolutely the coolest. And so we partnered up with NASA and we held, held this uh, 
forum in 2021. We were fortunate enough that Gina McCarthy, the, the White House climate advisor at the time, was able to join us. And we had over 30 organizations represented during the speakers. Um, by this time, we had now continued with the model of uh, virtual delivery. It actually makes it more accessible than just having kind of an in-person event. And we continue to have that in October, every Wednesday for two hours um, each week. So we've kind of replaced this one day event with this four day virtual delivery. And so once again, um, we had, we just continued to grow and we were really fortunate to have um, what we felt was an incredible turnout. We had over 3000 viewers. We had, um, you know, over 27, you know, nearly 2,700 people register and, and those were all great but the number that um, really that we key in on as a team is in that registration and participation over 900 or you know different organizations were represented and that's 900 different perspectives on how we address resilience and climate adaptation um, equity climate and these really important topics uh, so that was, kind of where we really first saw this, this amazing diversification and, and we've continued to push that. So following that model, um, we brought all of those, uh, those over 30 organizations together to create the Building Alliances for Climate Action resource. And again, we really want this to be uh, kind of this unifying voice for the whole community um, that they can use to help address climate change. So there's, again, stories in there, there's resources, and a whole, a whole number of um, reflections from that event as well. So finally, uh, just this past October, we held our alliances for inclusive resilience. So what did we, we wanted to figure out how to leverage, you know, kind of return and not, not leave equity behind because it's a critical component of what we do. The same thing for climate. And so we really wanted to talk about how we make the work that we do more, res more inclusive. And so our host this time was the Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative. Uh, if you're not familiar with that organization, uh, they work with all of the mayors and um, congressional members to, of cities and towns that are adjacent to the Mississippi River uh, on a, a number of topics. They've been incredible advocates for natural hazard mitigation and climate for many years, uh, and they're a fantastic partner. And so for this one, we had 34 speakers from 32 unique organizations that, you know, it is important for us to think about what those perspectives are. I think one of the coolest panels that we had, they're all very cool. One of the coolest panels were, was called um, Building a Sense of Belonging was the name of the panel. And how do we think about what it means to build a community in, in the many senses of the word build? And so we had um, an urban farmer we had a PhD engineer, we had an urban, and we had a private sector representative, and we had an, a, a local um, urban planner. And, you know, there's kind of, we want to bring together all of those perspectives, because it's not just the built environment, right? There's the nature component, there's the social um, component. And so we really try to make sure that we're bringing all those pieces together in, in those. And so here's some of the things I think one of the, a lot of the people a lot of people ask like what what do I get out of this? Um, you know, I'll start with the bottom one because it, it this is probably the the number one thing, and I think our team our team loves using this quote because Gina McCarthy said we were cool. And if you think Gina McCarthy's cool and you had the opportunity to ever interact with Gina McCarthy, I think she's super cool. <laughs> um, being told that you're cool by Gina McCarthy is awesome. But there's a lot of different perspectives, right? Some of it is partners come to us and it's an, it's an outlet for them to share new ideas and the things that they're working on. For some people, it's an opportunity to build new relationships. Uh, and for others, it's a, it's a way to be exposed to new perspectives. And that's, um, and that's really great. We wanna make it as much as we can. Um, each person is gonna have a different experience and we understand that but we wanna make sure that we're being as inclusive as possible and that people are getting value out of it. And so we just wanted to share a little bit of this um, of your peers. So with all of that being said, um, this is our newest initiative and that's Stories of Resilience. So I highlighted that over the last three years, we have integrated storytelling 
into each of our forums. So we've had, I think, four storytellers in each of the forums. And now we understand and know that the behavioral and social science, science research tells us storytelling is as effective or more effective than providing people with data. But most importantly for us, a partnership network, is that stories make people feel literally mentally more connected with one another. It helps you become more empathetic. It helps you feel like you are in more in that person's shoes. And that's a really important thing when we're trying to get people to connect and understand successes and challenges, barriers, and so forth. And so we expect this is going to, this is going to be a new multi-year initiative for us. So we're sunsetting the Building Alliances initiative and we're now ramping up literally just, um, just a couple of weeks ago, we did kind of our formal launch of the Stories of Resilience. And we want to learn more about people's journey, um, not just the good things. I think everyone, we, we all love sharing the good things, but it's equally important that we share the challenges that are being experienced and how do we help elevate what those challenges are, um, not just from an organizational perspective, but also personal perspectives. To do that, um, we're gonna need to build a lot of trust with people. Um, a lot of the stories that go untold are not, are not from by, that we really need and that really need to be heard. Um, they're not trusting of the federal government. They may not be trusting of large organizations. They, they're a lot harder um, to build that trust because they've been marginalized in the past. And so, our team is going to focus a lot on building those relationships and building that trust so that we can work with those individuals to share their story and make sure that they're being, you know, they're having an impact and that we're appropriately sharing their story. Um, I think a key component of this is also understanding that, you know, it's important for us to go advance, um, you know, hazard mitigation and, and climate adaptation in communities, but that's not, it, it, right, in many cases, is not the number one priority. And I, I, I tell the story a lot. Um, Lottie Ferguson, who is the chief resilience officer of Flint, Michigan, um, has become one, you know, a friend of the network, and we've worked with her. And she, she actually guest lectured a, a class of mine at Tulane, and um, for, at first was phenomenal. And it was a, a climate and equity class. And when she was finished, I asked the class how many times she said climate. And she didn't say it at all. The answer was zero. Um, there are things that are important to that community that certainly um, relate to holistic resilience and climate adaptation initiatives. But their prior they have other priorities that seemingly are well above that. And so when you think about water quality, when you think about air quality issues that they have, the systemic racism that's in the community, the inability for city and county to at times work together, um, those are really difficult. And so understanding uh, the challenges and the situations that communities and individuals face and, and having a better understanding of that really can help us tailor our approaches to be better partners to you know, we hear people say we meet them where they are a lot and to go into a community like that and to say hey like you know you really need to think about climate change is tough um, people are going to say hey I got other things to worry about you know like clean water and clean air and so um, these stories are meant to really help us connect and learn more about people in a very, in, in, in a human way. I think, that, you know, we are, as a federal agency, FEMA is huge. It's this behemoth at times is very intimidating. And I think one of the key components for us is to help use these stories to humanize our approach to communicating and interacting uh, with people and organizations. And so how can you get involved? And so you can submit photos video, audio, or text about your resilience journey, we're actually going to have to, we have this talking point, we're actually going to have to expand that because just a couple of weeks ago, someone asked if they could paint their story, their resilience journey. And absolutely, that sounds awesome. You know, we don't want to limit this. I think this is 
key for us. Um, regarding video, uh, our, our preference is that the, the videos are less than three minutes. Um, we're trying to optimize those for social media and um, optimize them for human attention span as well. And so we um, wanna make sure that we're keeping them concise, but giving everyone the time to uh, tell their story. We've had people share poetry, which has been actually really fantastic. We've had um, partners come on um, RMP and events and share a song. If that's the way you wanna share your story, absolutely. Um, we do have a focus area, understandably so, um, natural hazards and climate adaptation. And, and again, not just the successes, but also the challenges. And so I wanna share, um, here's the website for that. So it's, it's pretty simple, fema.gov backslash rnpn backslash stories. So I have one more slide because I promised Lori that I wanted to keep a lot of this time to help me to answer questions um, and so forth. We do have our monthly, um, this is a resilience exchange coming up and we're partnering with the US Department of Agriculture, their climate hubs to have a conversation on advancing rural and agricultural community resilience. So we're super excited about that. Uh, that'll be February 22nd at 1 p.m. So uh, again, I'll make sure that I share the link in the chat uh, for where you can register for that. And we'll hope to see you there. I am very available. Our team is very available. I'm super willing to put my email out there for anyone that wants to connect with me. If I cannot answer your question, I promise you I will connect you with someone at FEMA that can, particularly if it's, if it's FEMA focused. If you wanna learn more about the RNPN, if you wanna submit a story, just shoot us an email at fema-resilientnation at fema.dhs.gov. Um, same thing if you wanted to get on our distribution list to learn more information about as we progress through this initiative over the next couple of years, uh, the stories of resilience, if information on events and the newsletters, all of that um, will add you to our distro list and we'd love to we'd love to have you. So with that, I think I'm going to stop sharing. And oh, look at that. I'm dropping links in there and I'm not even <laughs> dropping links. Thanks to the amazing RNPN team that actually makes this network go around. I uh, for, like for dropping that they're, those in there. They're logged in as you, Brad. So it looked like as you were speaking that they very you were secretive. In the right, it was like secret. now everyone now everyone knows our secret. <laughs> well, Brad, thank you so much for that presentation, and thank you for joining us today. And uh, thank you to the participants who've been listening listening attentively. Tracy Kirkland already wrote in and was asking for a couple of links, so thank you to Tracy and to everyone. Um, and so. If you would now, if you have questions, please feel free to again use the chat box or the Q and A box. Either one is great. And as Brad said, he very he has left a generous amount of time to engage in questions and answers with the audience. And so I'd love to kick it off with the following just observation, but also question. Uh, first, just Brad, thank you for the. Um, the observation that this was a space that needed to be filled and it, the, the fact that this is an ongoing effort. And I think many of the metrics that you shared today were really promising. And I wondered if you would share with us um, what have you learned through these different engagements and, and the different activities that you so eloquently described what has been sort of, if you would say, this has been the major takeaway that I would like to share with others in terms of equitable, equitable engagement, how you can do it, how you can do it well, what, what's the, the number one takeaway you would share with other agencies, organizations who might want to learn that's that? A, that's a great question. Right? So um, for, for us, it's really hard to reach a great distance. Like I will say that as equitable as we try to be, we're still not reaching, you know, areas that are, um, that have low broadband accessibility where internet connectivity is limited. And, and that's something where we're trying to figure out, right? Um, the world has become 
so reliant on the, you know, the internet and this virtual component. Um, at first, this was a huge bonus to make our, the pro, you know, the network more equitable, right? It was very, it felt very centralized in DC. Um, our um, in-person forum was in DC. And so the virtual environment like exploded us uh, in, a, in a great way. I think there's two things that I want to say, and I'll start off with one is understand logistical needs of your partners. So uh, my team has heard me say it a million times, I will always change my schedule to make it more um, like schedule your partner first, and I will always reorient my schedule. Those Everyone that participates with the RNPN does so voluntarily. Um, because they support what we're trying to do and they believe in what we're trying to do. And so I will always, always make myself available. And I think that's important, availability. Availability and, and um, responsiveness. Mm -hmm. So I, I try not to let any email in our RNP and inbox sit there more than 48 hours. It's like a personal goal. Um, the other one, and this is really is really difficult, and for anyone that's been on um, any of our RNP events, um, please feel free to chime in if you if you feel the same. I am a thirty seven year old white male that lives in Washington D.C. that grew up in suburban and uh, middle class South Jersey, and I work for the federal government. I am not relatable to ninety nine percent of the country, and so. Um, mainly because I have to, uh, I welcome everyone to an RNP and event, and then I say thanks for coming. And that's like the only time I want anyone to see me. And I think one of the hardest things that we found for organizations um, to make it feel like an inclusive and equitable approach is this feeling that you have to be that you you have to be front and center representing your organization and pushing forward that mission. And as a matter of fact, we found it's the exact opposite. All of our events are partner driven. We, those diverse perspectives are what make it valuable. And that's the opportunity where we can bring in um, all of those people that are really doing the most fantastic work that no one's heard of. I think that's our team's goal is always to find those people that are just that are amazing that no one's that no one's hearing about what they're doing. And, and to do that, sometimes it requires a lot of coordination. Um, you know, I mentioned Nikki Cooley earlier, and whenever we do anything with Nikki or any of our tribal partners, we just know to build in a couple extra months, just simply because logistics are a little bit longer. Um, they have kind of, many of them have connectivity um, issues or concerns. And so we think about that in the design. And so I think a lot of times, um, I'll finish with this, a lot of times people feel like it's very difficult to operationalize equity. And a lot of it, I just tell people, like, if, you, if you're trying to be a good partner, if you're trying to run a good program, like replace partner with friend or organization with friend. And if it doesn't work, then you're not doing it right. We want everyone to be our friend. And if we want them to treat them that way as well. And so we're, we're doing better. But there's always going to be improvements. I think thinking about how we can get to, you know, we're going to have this conversation in a couple of weeks on rural and agricultural community resilience. But rural communities are one of the challenging places for us. And so how do we work with partners to reach that is, I think, a really tough thing. Mm. Yeah, Brad, thank you. Thank you for all of that. That's really powerful. And um I, I have another question that's coming to me about the reaching partners. And I think one of the things that you said that was really interesting, I'm going to tie it to something you said, and then to the question about the, um, the story of, of Jake and drawing in somebody that maybe does poverty reduction or they do or, uh, urban development, for example, but they don't, maybe they don't see themselves as a part of the quote unquote core hazards and disaster community, but yet we know that the challenges we face are so interlocking. And so the, the question is, 
how do you bring in people who don't see themselves as at risk or mitigation hazards and disasters aren't sort of their core focus but yet we need we need to build alliances to use your language we need to build the coalition and so how did you do that with Jake specifically and what yeah. do you have more broadly to bring in more players who are sort of at the interface of hazards and other social issues um, so first, you have to build yourself an amazing, amazing team of people mm -hmm. um, that help you do that, right? So there's a there's a, a a group of folks that definitely deserve significantly more credit than me. I just happen to be um, fortunate enough to be providing these remarks. But like, you have to be a good sales, a little or saleswoman or salesperson, right? You have to think about like, there's probably a reason. There's oftentimes a reason why people haven't interacted with some of this information. And, and Lori, to your point. Uh, now it's almost like a challenge, right? Find me an organization that isn't impacted by climate or natural hazards, right? Because it relates to everyone. Um, you know, if you're doing low-income housing, you want low-income affordable housing, but you also want it to be built to a standard, right, that protects those people from hazards and, you know, future climate threats, things like extreme heat and so forth, right? It's, you have to build yourself into like this almost interdisciplinary, like Swiss army knife, right? Because the challenge is to figure out what that connection is. And in Jake's case, we, we found it. But at the same time, you want to be respectful of that person's expertise, right? We don't necessarily always need that person to understand or have a full comprehension of resilience, right? A lot of times those people are providing value into a space that we've never interacted with before. And I think that's a lot of the value we get out of bringing these people together. I think, um, you know, our team goes about this in a way. It's like when you look at the panel, you kind of want to understand why they're all together, but then you want to be like, wait, wait, those perspectives are interesting. And, and that's kind of the way we approach it is like we use these a lot of times these events are great opportunities for us to build relationships with with new organizations it's a top it's the rnpn is a way for us to say hey look can you we'd like you to be involved with something we don't need anything from you in return and just participation if you'd like to and yeah i i think just going into these conversations with the mentality of, yes, this may be a totally foreign conversation to them, but it could, just knowing and doing your research and understanding what their mission area is and saying, hey, like this is, this is where we see the overlap and you are this amazing person that works in this space and we can learn so much from you. Mm, th thank you for that. And thank you to Dan for posting a, a, a question in the open chat to everyone. So I'll state that for those of you who are on the phone and while Brad has a chance to read it as well. So Dan, welcome. I, I too hail from a very rural area in the state of the great state of Kansas. And so welcome to a, fail, a fellow person from a rural area. So Dan said the following, he said, many of the surrounding communities are agriculturally based. What are you doing to maybe not put so much focus on group-based identities and using uh, terms like rural and agricultural communities could actually make people feel marginalized. Um, yeah. People are just people. How, how can we walk that fine line of there are real group-based patterns that we can see in the world as a way of organizing the world, but then as Dan's asking, how do we do it without making people feel marginalized? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So I'm going to answer, I'm going to provide two responses for this. So first, this is not a shameless plug, Dan. I would love if you could ask that question in two weeks on February 22nd, because it's really important. There, this is like a very interesting double-edged sword, right? We're trying to host an event to talk about a lot of the um, resilience priorities and, and challenges that non-urban communities have, right? I think part of the challenge here is that, and, and Laura, you work in this space, so I'll be, curious, I'd be interested in your opinion too, is like, urban areas and coastal areas get a disproportionate amount of attention. Um, understanding that, you know, 50% of the population or so lives within, what, 100 miles of the coast and so forth. But we need, 
we use those descriptors in our case as like to help focus um, like people's interest, not to um, kind of put a label on those groups, right? We, we wanted to kind of drive people to say, hey, this is like a focus area for this conversation. But I understand, right? There's, um, this is a very difficult question. And I don't know if I, I have an answer, right? You want to, you don't want to classify people, but there's a need to, to categorize them in a way that help people understand the variations and the different um, challenges or, or needs that organizations have. And, and man, I don't, I don't have an answer for that. That's, I know I'm, I'm, I, I oddly feel comfortable saying that, but that is a difficult, it's a very difficult thing. And Dan, I would, uh, if you're willing to come off the, um, off mute, or if we can, if you have any additional perspective, I, I would be curious what your perspective is and how you would be interested, you know, how, how we could approach it in a way that felt more inclusive of, of your personal feelings and, and those of the, uh, the community around you, mm. because it's, it's hard. And, um, and Dan just said, I, I appreciate it. the response doesn't have audio, but just Dan, um, thank you again for the, the question and Brad, thank you for that answer. And Dan, I hope you will take that uh, invitation for the February 22nd event really seriously, because I'm thinking about how oftentimes group-based labels that we have used over the years and the decades and the centuries have shifted because people who are members of those groups have advocated for labels that more fit with their lived experiences and, and so forth. And so um, I think it's a really good question. I think it's also really important to recognize that there are, again, these group-based patterns that appear in our social world. And so how do we walk that line, as Brad's saying? And so again, Dan, fabulous question. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. Hope you're going to be here February 22nd. And um, Brad, I'm going to actually grab, there are a couple of other questions and comments coming in. So I'm going to grab those. Uh, Deb made the point that she said she'd really love to um, encourage or to hear more about what is FEMA doing to ensure that you are hiring people with the lived experience that matches with these different um, diverse experiences that you're trying to highlight through your work. So she gives an example that she's an older adult with disabilities, recently hired to build and lead an energy resilience and mitigation program for the state where Deb lives. So congratulations, Deb. Um, and yeah, will you say, Brad, what are you doing to really bring in those differences yeah. to the core? Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so Deb, that's a, that's a great comment. And I'll, I'll say that Many federal agencies are are actively working with this right now. So internal diversity, equity, and inclusion, like hiring practices and things like that. And I'm not the right person to speak on that. And if there's if you're interested in in kind of learning what FEMA is doing, I'm happy to try and, and connect you. Um, access and functional needs in the disability you know community is has been a priority for us. Um, actually, one of our recorded audio stories is from um, Valerie Novak, who was formerly at the Center for American Progress. I believe she's out at um, Utah, University of Utah. And she talks about how she got into this. And um, we've worked really hard with um, our access and functional needs folks internally and um, working with state emergency management agencies on integrating those perspectives into, um, into our events. And so some of it is just holding yourself accountable to make sure that you're, you're bringing in those perspectives. And I think this kind of leads to, I see Tracy's and sorry, Lori, I'm not trying to steal your job, I promise. But some of this leads into uh, Tracy's question. And so I'll read it if you're on the phone. So since trust is a critical aspect of network success, how do you go about building trust in and across such a diverse network, diverse in terms of demographics, perceptions of resiliency and priorities? And um, there's this really interesting, uh, I'm gonna, early on in business, like pre-internet, right? The way you did business was you provided a good service and it was all word of mouth. And the number one, the number one compliment for, for our team is when someone introduces us to someone else. And 
when we understand these kind of like this idea of social capital and social trust and working across a network, I mentioned earlier, treating people like they are your friend. When we have these conversations, it's not just that individual that we're building a relationship with, right? We're building a relationship with their network. We want to build a sense of trust. And so these events are almost a a way to to build that sense of trust, right? We're very transparent about how we try to design our our programs and our programming. And if it doesn't work, let us know. Um, When we bring all of these different perspectives in throughout the year, um, we learn from them, we make adjustments. And and really the number one thing, and I said this earlier, and and someone test me on my email right now, go for it, is people want to be heard. And then they want to, and then they want someone to take action. It's responsiveness. Our, it's so Im- incredibly important for our team to make people feel like they are heard and appropriately heard. And I am not the. I've I've been with FEMA for three and a half years, and I've learned so much. But I'm by no means the FEMA expert, and I can't tell you how many questions that come into our team that have that I have no idea about. And it's just connecting that person, being willing to put in that time and effort, and and hopefully that shows. And so that's how we've we've really worked to to build trust is is through positive relationships with people. And and Laura, you're like, what's one of the things that you you've learned the most? And you asked specifically to equity, but like the power of people is amazing. I'd I'd crash our our NPN website and just work through people. It's the, the the word of mouth, the people that in, interact with the network are a million times more effective than our website. And, and I, I think both of those come together, right? It's not one one group, right? We Not one labeled group over another, right? It's everyone. And if we, if we, if there's a perspective you haven't heard us involved, you know, involved in our events, let us know. You know, people that are, you know, we're constantly um, hearing like amazing people, let us know and we'll, we'll engage them. We'll bring them together. But I think that's the, one of the other reasons we wanted to promote this story, these stories of resilience, right? It's meant to be partner driven, not FEMA driven. And so that we can share all of these perspectives and learn from them. Nice. Thank you so much, Brad. And thank you for tying those questions together so beautifully. And we received a, another question comment from Leslie Martinez Roman in the chat directly to us saying that uh, Leslie really agreed with what Deb had to say and making the point that one of the ways to combat various forms of discrimination, including racial and ethnic discrimination, is through increasing representation of historically underrepresented groups such as members of the BIPOC community. Um, And, but then also Leslie makes a great point. It's also, it's about demographic underrepresentation, but also disciplinary. So Leslie's also speaking to that planners are key to this. And so to Leslie's question, how, how do you, Brad, through the um, RNPN, how do you think about sort of right, like demographic diversity, uh, academic diversity, functional diversity in terms of the skill sets, like bringing in planners and social scientists and so forth. So how do you sort of think about all yeah. the different categories of diversity? That's a, yeah. We're asking all Thank of you. the, all the secret sauce questions. Um, you know, I think a lot of, and this is when we do like partnership stuff across RMD and, and externally, we get asked this question a lot. And yeah. One of the things where we see a lot of the failure is starting with like everyone is predisposed or has these biases to go towards organizations or individuals they've worked with before or that they've seen or that they've been exposed to. Mm-hmm. And we we like and build and that's how a lot of times panels will get built out or events will get built out. And so we totally like re-engineer, we, ba- we reverse engineer that. So when we when we're going through and we think about things that are important for our events, we, t- we, we highlight and start with the perspective that really needs to be involved. And so if that, we need a tribal perspective, you know, if we need BIPOC, like underserved, historically marginalized, you know, organiza- like an organization that represents um, marginalized or historically um, underrepresented communities, we, that needs to be there. We, if we need an academic, you know, 
person, if we need a building science person, like what is critical to the conversation? And I will tell you right now, anyone that tells you that it's hard to build panel diversity is not telling the truth. Um, our team, when you, when you build it out that way and you find the right person, and I will say that it, there's not just a one right person, many times they're amazing, right many people. Um, we get to the diversity naturally. Like there's, you know, to, to Deb's point, like there's, there's amazing, you know, BIPOC people, individuals that are doing this work. They're just oftentimes not getting the exposure. When we look in, when we do all this research and we find all these people, it's like, yeah, let's, oh my gosh, how is, how is, how have they never been on a panel before? How have we never come, you know, how have we never interacted with them before? Let's, let's do our best to work with them. That's how we approach it. And it's less about who and more about what the value and the perspective is. And we start that way and work backwards. And that's just how we've done it. And it's worked really well for us. Thank you for that. And Brad, we have another minute or two for Q&A and then we'll transition to the close. But uh, we're going to have Linda's a question as our final question for today, which is a really powerful one that brings a time dimension into all this. And, and again, great questions today, everyone. Thank you. Um, Linda said, uh, post-disaster as a community enters into that recovery phase, what is the best way for recovery and resilience practitioners to coordinate and to integrate to support impacted communities? Yeah. So first, hi, Linda. Mm -hmm. um, if you're, you know, Talk about an awesome individual, um, you know, BIPOC individual doing this work. Linda's amazing. Um, unless it's a different Linda Lowe, but I'm pretty sure that's the same Linda Lowe that was at the Small Business Administration at FEMA. We stole our feet to FEMA. Um, but, you know, this is a great question, I think. And I, um, and so I think Lori knows I teach at, at GIS at Georgetown. And I think one of the things, the biggest frustrations that I have is that, um, is the, 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 emergency management life cycle diagram where it breaks down like each one into four phases. And each one sort of looks like it has this tangible like delineated beginning and end and it's totally not true. And I think um, this idea of as a community enters into the recovery phase of an event is really, is really difficult, right? There are parts of New Orleans, like part, Lower Ninth Ward's a great example, that are still in the recovery phase. Like what, what does recovery end? What does the end of recovery look like? And I think there's that main question, but also how do we build in re more resilient and mitigated practices into the, directly into the recovery? And you know, that's something FEMA's working on right now. Um, but this is the number one thing. Um, and I think, it's hazard mitigation, like having the partnerships pre-disaster, they decrease the burden on responders and expedite recovery. Like I think, um, Lori, someone you know, Jamie Lee used to tell me I need to get that tattooed on my arm, but it's building relationships before. Um, I know Linda, that's kind of, I'm not, I promise I'm not trying to sidestep your question about when a community enters the recovery phase, but the reason I think this partnership piece is so important. And one of the reasons we push partnerships so hard is because those, those relationships are instrumental when you get into those other phases. And the best thing that you can do for as a recovery practitioner is be best friends with the people before the disaster, right? At FEMA, for those of you that have never been to FEMA headquarters, the pre-disaster work, and I realize we're close to time, so I'll finish this as a story, is in building 400, is in one building, and response and recovery is in building 500. So like f literally and figuratively, FEMA is divided. And so one of the things um, we always joke about is that building 500 for response and recovery is, should be building 400's biggest supporter, right? Because everything we do before reduces that burden and really expedites recovery. So Linda, if anything, and if you need an introduction to anyone, you're, you got it. Um, build those relationships before, because they're just, when you, in the moment, you know who to go to. Mm -hmm. Linda, thank you for ending us with that question. And Brad, with your response, I'm just really moved 
And it's just such a reminder that not only can we do better work logistically and practically, but also ethically that, that, that everything you're saying. And so I don't know whether you're going to get that tattooed or not, as Jamie Lee suggested, but I do think it's a really, really um, imperative statement that you've closed on there on top of a really wonderful presentation. And so everybody, if you would, please a warm virtual round of applause and thanks and gratitude for Brad in the chat, if you would. And again, remember his offer, please do reach out to him uh, via email. If you have questions, comments, thoughts, concerns, or want to share your story as he so generously invited us to do. So again, Brad, thank you for honoring us. If you are here and hoping to uh, receive the emergency management credit from IAEM. Katie will drop in the chat one more time how you can get that credit. So thank you for being here. And again, thanks to IAEM. We also hope that all of you will visit our Hazard Center website at hazards.colorado.edu and sign up for future webinar updates as well as for other resources that are offered through the Natural Hazard Center. And then just a teaser for next month, we will indeed be back here on March 14th and we'll be hearing from uh, uh, Max and Anna who are authors of Soaking the Middle Class, Suburban Inequality and Recovery from Disaster, a new book about Hurricane Harvey, recovery, resilience, mitigation and adaptation. You'll hear all about it. So we hope to see you then. And we want to end as we always begin with gratitude for all of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the work that you do. And thank you for joining us today. We look forward to see you, seeing you in March and please take care of yourself and others. Bye. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye.